as an anthropologist, I've been trained to think about um, connections and relations between different spheres and facets of life. Um, and so that's exactly what I'm trying to do, look at the intersections of ecology, capitalism, indigeneity, colonialism, health, justice also, as they manifest and are given meaning by people um, on the ground who are very much living in the midst of large scale capitalist transformations and all the environmental unravelings that these transformations um, then uh, provoke. <laughs> Hello and welcome to another episode of Idioms of Normality on Future Framed TV, the collective podcast series of Traces Dreams. I'm your host, Dr. Paul Mason, and I'm joined today with Dr. Sophie Chow. Sophie, welcome so much. Welcome to the series. Hi, Paul. It's wonderful to be in conversation with you on Idioms of Normality. I've all, I almost said welcome so much. I've never heard anyone say welcome so much before, but it's all about not being normal, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. And tell us a bit about yourself before we jump in. Uh, people love to know a bit about the people I'm speaking with. Sure. Um, so, well, first of all, I'm speaking to you today from the unceded lands of the Darug people here in Darug Nation. And I just want to start by acknowledging Darug elders, past, present and emergence, uh, and also Darug kin, both human, animal, vegetal and elemental. So I'm Sophie, I'm an environmental anthropologist, which means I'm interested in the ways in which different human societies conceptualize, interact with, and engage with the natural world. Um, I came to become an anthropologist uh, through my prior career in the human rights sector when I was working uh, as an advocate uh, and researcher in Indonesia. Uh, looking particularly at the ways in which indigenous uh, communities in Indonesia experience and conceptualize uh, large scale radical environmental transformations that are happening across their lands and territories from deforestation and timber plantations to oil palm developments and mining. Uh, more recently, my attention has been focused on a region of Indonesia called West Papua, which is part of the island of New Guinea. Uh, and in West Papua, uh, I've been working closely with one in particular indigenous uh, group, the Marind, uh, who are facing large scale deforestation and monocrop oil palm developments, uh, and who are theorizing and interpreting these transformations in an incredibly interesting way in the sense that it is very much understood as a multi-species phenomenon, something that's affecting humans, but also plants, animals, and ecosystems. Wow, that's just a just a small <laughs> few number of things there to be to be handling. So you're juggling a lot of topics in in this in in these single projects. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think as an anthropologist, I've been trained to think about um, connections and relations between different spheres and facets of life. Um, and so that's exactly what I'm trying to do, look at the intersections of ecology, capitalism, indigeneity, colonialism, health, justice also, as they manifest and are given meaning by people um, on the ground who are very much living in the midst of large scale capitalist transformations and all the environmental unravelings that these transformations um, then uh, provoke. Yeah, I, I've certainly found that that anthropology gives us a skill set to, uh, to look at things holistically, to bring together diverse ways of understanding the same topic but also the the multiple strands of information that feed into the bigger picture and, and that's one thing I really enjoy about um, anthropology and and the the path that you've taken from human rights into working with the marine people in West Papua is super fascinating so Sophie with uh with with this incredible background of research and advocacy in uh, human rights and in anthropology with the marine people in West Papua how does someone with your perspectives and experiences answer the question, what is normal? Okay, so I'm going to answer that question by focusing on one aspect of the normal um, that was really at the heart of um, my research in Papua and the long and arduous apprenticeship that I received um, as I was trying to unpack, untangle and understand 
about um, what it means to be marine in the place that is Papua. Uh, and that particular focus is on plants as people. So for the longest time, community members uh, would be talking about particular people um, describing their emotions, their temperament, their personality, their actions, their behaviors. Uh, and for the longest time, I assumed that they were talking about other human beings uh, within the village or uh, you know, across their community. Often, um, they weren't actually talking about humans. They were talking about plants. Sago palms, nipa palms, eucalyptus trees, sago groves, sacred forests. Each of these vegetal entities and communities was a kind of person each of them had a particular way of being in the world, particular dispositions, affordances, desires, needs, and therefore impacts on a whole array of other life forms, animals, humans, ecosystems, and more. So what did this teach me or invite me to consider? Well, it invited me to take seriously the possibility of a world in which plants as pers persons is normal. Right? Um, and this is important because it pushes against a whole range of normals um, that tend to dominate in a lot of Western ideologies. Uh, the first is human exceptionalism, this idea that humans by virtue or vice of their biology and cognitive affordances are somehow superior to other kinds of life forms. Um, it also invites us to think about a world in which uh, an egalitarian sort of personhood is distributed across a whole range of different species and also elements. Um, in both of those regards, then, thinking about plants as persons as, the, as a new kind of normal um, is really a, a way of being in the world that is choose these kinds of hierarchies of species that so often position the human at the apex of a chain of meaning and value, and instead invites us to think about uh, what it might need to relate to vegetal agents as kin, as communities and as co-participants in the making and unmaking of our shared multi-species worlds. I love that. I love that, that the experience of being in another community who see the world and experience the world completely differently challenges familiar conceptualizations of normality. And through the work of anthropology, we attempt to entertain the possibility that their life world is normal for us. And so we try to normalize their experiences in our own ethnography to make sense of it from the inside. And, and here you're talking about an experience with the Marind people of West Papua who talk about plants and organisms as kin, as having, it sounded like you, you, you were talking about them, these plants and organisms as having personalities, as having uh, jealousies and and uh, emotions that we would normally attribute normally attribute to human beings, but in this instance, the, these kinds of character traits are being attributed to plants and trees, and that's that's well outside the normal experience of people in in Western countries. So, how did you how did you traverse? that understanding how did you move into a world where the trees and the plants were were kin when i first went to the field um as a good classically trained anthropologist um i was spending a huge amount of time asking questions to community members and taking notes and one of the most frequent injunctions that i received from my interlocutors was stop writing, start walking, stop thinking, start listening. And say that, this say that command, again. Stop, stop writing, start walking. Yes. Stop writing, start listening. Wow. Okay. And who, who was saying this? this is the people that you were interviewing and, and working with? Absolutely. Yes. So they yeah. kept, you know, this, this injunction kept coming at me from increasingly, you know, impatient and annoyed interlocutors whom I was just bombarding with questions, right, trying to extract from them um, these narratives and discourses about what it means to become with plants in the way that they say they do. Um, what, why walking? Um, well, because walking the forest, going to, as they say, meet plants, the Gikinal, uh, sagu in this case, um, is, the, is the best way to come to understand what it means to become with a plant. So that means deep, non-human, hanging out with plants in the grove, often in expeditions that could last from two to four months, um, and that involved this sort of deep, 
sensory immersion in the space of the forest, learning to listen, becoming attentive to the sounds of animals and other birds, learning also to observe, scrutinize the appearance of trees, because on their bark is inscribed their pasts, their relations, periods of drought, fires, epidemics, and so forth learning to distinguish one type of plant from another, learning their names and also their stories. Um, so this sort of you know, deep um, attunement and, and becoming embedded or immersed in the world of the plant is absolutely central to coming to understand um, their being, right? Um, in a way that is far removed from the abstract conceptualization of plants you know, in terms of taxonomies or, or categories or, or uses, right? This is about hanging out with the plant to better understand the plant in the same way you would with any human interlocutor, right? Um, I think another key way in which I learned to, um, or I tried to understand what it meant to, to, to coexist with plants, um, was by thinking with Marind um, about plantations, right? Um, this is a landscape where biodiverse forests are increasingly being replaced by monocrops of oil palm. Um, oil palm is a key source of palm oil that is ubiquitous in everyday goods that you and I and global consumers, you know, uh, purchase and use on a daily basis. So going back to that question of connections, thinking through connections that you were mentioning earlier, um, here was a plant, here was a product that I could absolutely relate to. It was very much part of my everyday life. Um, even as my own everyday life was so different or, or, or of a different kind of normal to that of the marine communities whose world I was trying to understand. At the end of the day, this one plant connected us in more or less lively or lethal ways, right? I can see how their experience of the world is challenged by the, uh, these new plantations of monocrops. So how, how is their sense of normality, how, is, how are their lives changing when their kinship relationships outside of the human world are changing as well. The monocrop form um, is one that is very much perceived by Marin as abnormal, in the sense that these are landscapes that are dominated by a single plant that is usually um, you know, incredibly homogeneous. Um, monocrops are very, very simplified environments um, dominated by a single cash crop. Um, and for Marin, there's something deeply uncanny and disturbing, unsettling, even anxiogenic about what they call these modern forests, right? Where everything looks the same, no matter how far or in which direction you walk and in which you really have no reference points um, in the way you would in the forest because everything looks the same everywhere you look, right? Right? It is a world that they say um, in which everywhere becomes nowhere and nowhere becomes everywhere. So that really speaks, I think, to the deep sort of disorientation that a homogeneous monocrop landscape evokes for people who see it as very much unnatural um, because it's so in contrast to the biodiversity of their native forests. How are they experiencing these, these strange capitalist natures? And um, well, I would say that there are effects that ripple across all spheres and species that, uh, that animate the marine life world. People will often talk about, um, you know, deforestation and oil palm expansion as something that doesn't only render humans vulnerable to food insecurity um, and, and, and territorial dispossession, it's also one that jeopardizes the futures and fates of a whole range of other communities of life, um, birds, animals, um, plants, rivers, mountains, uh, all of whom are considered to be sentient and bound through relations of kinship with Marin through, through common descent from ancestral spirits. So um, these are communities of fate um, where harms are distributed both within and across the, the, the category of the human. There are other ways in which these ruptures are being experienced. Many animals are now seeking shelter in marine villages because they're losing their homes um, to, to oil palm. Uh, and so these animals are becoming new domesticates or pets, right? What kind of animals are becoming domesticated in these marine villages? So we're talking cassowaries, uh, we're talking possums, we're talking deer, we're talking boars. Uh, we're even talking crocodiles uh, who now approach the villages in search of both shelter and subsistence uh, because their forest is disappearing. Are there, is there animal human conflict or is it managed? It's very much managed, um, but it's also deeply troubling. Um, Marind have not traditionally been uh, horticulturalists and uh, they don't rear or breed animals. Uh, and again, that goes back to their ethos of, of multi-species 
refugees freedom and autonomy. So to domesticate is seen as abnormal by Marin because it's seen to take away the freedom and autonomy uh, of plants and animals, right? To, to strip them of something, uh, to strip them of their dignity uh, in the same way that um, you know, a human that is kept captive would be stripped of their freedoms and, and capacity to, 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 to behave and be autonomously. So these animals that are now approaching the villages are deeply problematic. Uh, Marin take care of them because they know that they have no forest um, to, to survive or thrive in. But at the same time in doing so, they're having to exercise some degree of control or mastery over animals who are in the process losing their freedoms and autonomy. And in a place like West Papua, that's been under settler colonial rule for over 60 years, there are some really uncanny resonances between the fate of these orphans of the forest, as Marin call them, and also the fate of their human keepers, who are themselves very much captive to the violence and hegemony of settler colonial rule in West Papua. Wow. So the the reluctant domesticators of these animals that are being displaced through deforestation and and these monocrops that are who's running these monocrops it's large multinational companies absolutely right and so it in in some ways there's a there's a conflict there between the large multinational com companies asserting their normality which is oh we have one plant we we <laughs> we reproduce it a lot in large expanses of territory and we remove heterogeneity and yet for the Marin, heterogeneity is normal. Having biodiversity is normal. It's the monocrops which are abnormal. And in the bigger scheme of things, uh, I really like this idea that domestication is abnormal. We in, in the West or in Australia or in, in our experience, in my experience, having a pet dog and having a pet cat is, is normalised to the point that we have whole sections of grocery stores dedicated to the domestication of, of pets in your house. Um, and that experience would be completely abnormal to the Marind who, who have not dedicated so much time, energy, labor, and, and commodities to domesticating non-human animals. And yet there's a, even though they're not domesticating these animals, there's a conversation between them and plants and the other animals. There's a, there are kinship ties What's it like to have a kinship tie with an animal whose interests diverge from yours? Thanks, um, Paul. That's a great question. Um, and I think it's really important to highlight, as you say, that sometimes the interests of humans and other than humans can and do diverge. Um, all beings come into being through their relations to one another, but not all of these relations are good or necessarily likely and nurturing or, or sustaining for all the beings involved. Um, so when it comes to animals and humans whose interests diverge, I think one really um, you know, generative space of interaction to uh, draw from is hunting. Marinda are traditionally hunter-gatherers, uh, which means they derive their subsistence primarily from foraging, gathering, um, hunting and fishing. Um, and in the space of hunting particularly, uh, there are all kinds of ways in which uh, Marin hunters, um, you know, ritualize um, the act of hunting in ways that um, engage with the divergent interests and dispositions of the objects of hunting animals. So there are rituals, for instance, to coax the animal to approach, to entice them to give themselves up. Um, hunters will sing to the animal, hunters will celebrate the pasts and stories and genesis of that particular species. And hunters will also explain to the animal why it is that they are being hunted and what their flesh or other resources will do to sustain um, the life worlds of marine present and to come. And so there are all kinds of ways in which uh, cultural norms, if you wish, um, create a, a, an emotional and uh, material connection between the hunter and the hunted that then signifies or gives meaning to the hunt uh, and to the act of killing um, in a way that is, is, is radically different to how one might understand the act of taking another's life. Um, I think another really interesting uh, way to think about uh, divergent human and animal interests um, is through indigenous marine ways of thinking about food and eating. Uh, so marine often talk about, um, you know, the forest is this nourishing feeding realm, but it's also a realm uh, where, as they say, uh, people become good food for others. And what does this mean? Well, the forest nourishes marines, it offers them 
foods um, derived from the plants and animals who populate the forest, but moment also become good food for others when their sweat um, you know, comes into contact with vegetation when they're walking with the forest, when they leave behind seeds or food for other animals and plants to feed off. Um, Marin talk about their own bodies feeding the forest when they die and their bodies decompose to nourish all kinds of microbial and other insect communities, as well as the soils and nutrients embedded within the landscape that are going to sustain the life courses of a whole range of other organisms. So this idea of um, you know, reconciling interests by positioning oneself, not just as the eater or the consumer, but also as a kind of food that sustains others, the human as a feeder of, other than human ecology, I think, is a really powerful way of thinking about how to keep divergent interests um, you know, in tension with one another, but also in ways that um, you know, invite us to rethink our own positionality as feeder, as fed, and as food within these sorts of multi-species uh, worlds. Sophie, you're bringing such rich ideas to the table, and I'm really interested to ask you the question. What questions should we ask about normality? I think, um, well, there's a range of different questions that I think are important to stay with um, as we problematize or try to unpack normality across space, across time, across species. Um, the first, I think, is the question of how or why something becomes normal, right? Uh, among marines, this notion of plants as, as persons is something that's core to their cosmology, to their uh, belief system, to their value systems. Um, but what is normal can also also changed over the course of time. Um, Marin themselves are now uh, understanding plant-human relations differently um, in the wake of the plantation and in the wake of their encounters uh, and knowledge exchanges with a whole range of outside entities um, from corporations and government representatives to NGOs and inquisitive anthropologists like myself. So the normal changes, um, it is a process, it transitions, it transforms, and some normals are always more powerful than others, right? Um, if we think about human exceptionalism, um, the centrality or the primordiality of the human compared to other life forms. Uh, we might say that is a far more potent um, and influential uh, normal than other kinds of normal where the human is one amongst a much broader spectrum of meaningful life um, and species with legible cultural, political and historical biographies. And so thinking about normalities as, you know, um, always embedded within asymmetrical power fields, I think is really important to bear in mind. Um, I think that the other thing I'd, I'd, I'd mention when it comes to, you know, interrogating no normality um, is, is often the normal is uh, associated with the mundane and the everyday. Um, and yet the normal is often the most interesting place to start asking questions, right? The sort of taken for grantedness of what counts as normal um, is, is often one of the most potent sites, not only question how we understand the normal in our particular worlds uh, and places, uh, but how the normal in itself is a really fertile site for unearthing meaningful similarities, meaningful differences, and then the differences that those differences make um, to the ways in which we inhabit the world and then act upon or fashion the world um, in differently creative sorts of ways. Um, and finally, I think given we've been talking about plants as persons as a particular kind of vegetal normal, um, you know, we live in an age of self devouring growth. Um, the Anthropocene uh, is this era of planetary unraveling that is caused in large part by the scale and speed of human activity that are affecting ecosystems across local and global scales. Um, so thinking about plants as persons, I suppose, is an invitation to inhabit not an Anthropocene, a human-centric world, but a Planthropocene, in the words of Natasha Myers, a world in which uh, we coexist with plants as, as sentient, agentive, consequential, meaningful life forms um, towards the making of, of, of more just and less um, unevenly distributed multi-species futures. Um, the kind of form that this Planthropocene might take will differ across space, time, and communities both human and non-human, but I think there's something really powerful about this invitation to recalibrate um, the values um, and, and, and meanings we associate to different life forms um, in a more sort of egalitarian uh, and, and multi-species way. Dr. Sophie Chow, thank you so much for joining us on Idioms of Normality on Future Frame TV, the collective podcast series of Traces Dreams. It's been an absolute pleasure to learn about your experiences and your perspectives on normality. Huge thank you, Paul, uh, for inviting me to speak on Idioms of Normality, um, and I look forward to continuing the conversation with you and the auditors. 
And don't forget to like, uh, share and subscribe. <laughs> <laughs>